Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias. And great plat a great crowd of people followed him there because they saw signs that he had performed the healing of the sick. Then Jesus went up to the mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw the great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this question only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon's, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the, lo the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed the to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with pieces of five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the signs that Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who has come to the world. Jesus, knowing what they intended to come make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Let's pray together. Father, we pause. We pause to remember. We pause to give you thanks. We pause to praise your name and to respond. To respond in joy with shouts of praise and in the singing of truth over one another. And we pause to stand before your word that we would be shaped by it, that our hearts would be transformed by the repetitive sitting within it. So we pray that you would do that this morning. Would you speak by the power of your spirit and would we be ready to receive it? We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last Monday was a big day. Uh, if you didn't know, on Monday, April 8th, 2024, around 1.40 to 1.44 in the afternoon, there was a total solar eclipse. Uh, the first time in this area since 1878, and we won't see it again in this city until, I want to get this right, 2317. I'm not even sure if I'm saying that right, because it's so far in the future. Um, but Monday, April 8th was a big day. And, and to be honest, I, my expectations weren't that high. Uh, I had heard the phrase uh, path of totality, but I remembered the 2017 eclipse, and I was like, I don't, why are people traveling all over the place for this? I remembered seeing that, and, and I don't know what the word totality is, but now I've used it probably 100 times in the last week. Um, but regardless, it was a big day, and I and my family did what a lot of us did. We were in the backyard, and we were staring up. We were laying down wearing astronaut sunglasses, hoping they were legitimate. Um, I can see, so I think we're okay. Uh, I ate my first ever moon pie, which I have in my notes. I learned they are not good. Uh, <laughs> uh, Eva, back in the back, took offense to that. So <laughs> if you like moon pies, you can have all of my extras. Uh, and I was drinking a sun-kissed, so you can see that we were very on theme. We, like everyone, were waiting. And we, like everyone, were hoping that, that the cloud cover would break so that we could experience and see this once-in-a-lifetime moment. And so as the clock ticked and we got closer and closer to 1.40 in the afternoon, the sky got darker and darker and darker. It looked like a filter was being put over our eyes. And then it happened. It happened. The moon completely blocked out the sun. Day turned to night. We took our glasses off and stared straight up, defying all logic. The stars came out. We could see planets. The temperature dropped. The streetlights came on. Christopher Nolan's interstellar soundtrack was reverberating through the atmosphere. And my, my kids had no clue what to do. They had no clue what was happening. My wife... Uh, 
got emotional, as some of you may have. I didn't know if I needed to lay down or stand up or run around or take pictures or uh, say a prayer, hug my family, or all of these things at the same time. We saw Bailey's beads, another phrase I learned. Uh, We have a picture of these. Uh, The literal sunlight piercing through the peaks and valleys on the surface of the moon. I've learned so much this week. Um, But as soon as I was settled enough within the experience, the chaos of I have three and a half minutes to experience this, what, what do I do? As soon as I was settled enough to experience the moment, the lights came back on. And the moment had passed. It was over. I, I wanted four more minutes. Three and a half more minutes. I wanted three and a half more minutes of this experience I could barely comprehend in the moment and am still struggling to put words to. What it felt like. What it looked like. I want to see it again. I now understand why people travel to see it. And all week, my Facebook and Instagram feeds have been full of pictures and videos from the eclipse. I'm sure yours are the same. Some from cell phones. Uh, We have one from from mine. It's very nice, very nice, eight megapixel. Uh, And some from the International Space Station that are a little bit better. Absolutely blows my mind, blows my mind. In all my searching every day, scrolling, trying to find images that capture a sense of the feeling I felt in those three and a half minutes. In all my searching, all, even the best, have fallen short of the feeling of the moment of totality. It's 101 times. It's worth traveling for to experience it. But to find it, to find it is impossible. Because we know this truth, that observation from afar falls short of participation. My attempts to recreate the feeling, to look and to scroll and to search, to see it again, to find something that felt the same, falls flat every time because observation falls short of participation. And we know this is true because nothing satisfies like experiencing the real thing. Nothing satisfies like experiencing the real thing. Our text this morning invites us to to a whole number of questions. We're in John chapter 6, and and one of the primary questions I want to begin with is, are you an observer or a participant in the life with Jesus? Have you settled for hearing about others' experiences? Have you settled for seeing or reading about their experiences of Jesus while, while falling short of your own? falling short of ongoing participation in the experience of life with him. Are you an observer or a participant? As we read in John chapter 6, we're, we're continuing as in, our, in making our way through the gospel of John. And if you're a note taker, you'll notice we've skipped chapter 5. It's nothing against chapter 5. We would just be preaching John for three years if we went all the way through. Um, but I do want to mention, if, if you want to join us in the reading through the, the fullness of, of John uh, we have a link to, to our Daily First 15, a resource that we produce here. Pastor Jan writes that for us, and so I'd invite you to, to capitalize on, on that opportunity to read as a community through the Gospel of John. But as Hunter has read for us, we're in the sixth chapter of John's Gospel, and if you've closed your Bible already, I'd invite you to open that back up, page 1656. We're going we're gonna to have touch points all the way through this chapter. From the miracle that we've read about and the meaning and the message that Jesus unfolds for us. And so to quickly summarize what we've already heard today, it's a familiar story, the feeding of the 5,000, which a lot of folks uh, estimate actually to be 10 or 12,000 if you include the women and children uh, and not just the men who are noted here. And as the story goes, we hear that Jesus is near the Sea of Galilee on a mountainside with his disciples, and a massive crowd has followed him. And why have they followed him? They've followed because they've heard what he's done and what he is doing. They've seen the signs, and they want to draw close. They want to travel to observe. They're curious of who this person is who has the power to do these things. They come to see what else he might do. 
And they come to see if possible, if in any way what he can do, he could do for me, for them. And so when Jesus sees the huge crowd coming toward him, he can see that they're hungry and it means they're going to have a problem. And so he turns to his disciples and he asks Philip in verse 5, Hey, Philip, where can we buy bread for these people to eat? Have you ever answered a rhetorical question? It's the sort of thing that keeps you up at night. It's an awkward moment, and that's what Philip steps into. He doesn't know what to do, and so he says, I don't know, Jesus. It would take a ton of money, even for them to have a single bite, for every person to have a single bite. But Andrew doesn't know what to do either. The best he can do is point out that there's a boy nearby who's holding his lunch. Five barley loaves and two small fish. But as soon as Andrew mentions the possibility of using this boy's lunch, he loses faith that it could happen. He loses faith halfway through his own sentence. It's not going to be enough. We don't have enough money. This boy's lunch is not enough. But we read in verse 6, you'll see Jesus already had in mind what he was going to do. And so as we know the story to go, he sits the people down. He, he, there's this funny detail. There's enough grass. So everyone sits down. He takes the loaves. He gives thanks. He distributes the bread and fish. And as the story goes, miraculously, they eat more than they could ever want. Twelve baskets are left over at the end of the meal. And we read in verse 14, if you, if you jump down, after the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they begin to say, surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. And if this is the prophet who was promised long ago, and he is able, he has the power to do these things, he must be the one to lead us now. And so things begin to get out of hand, and we read that Jesus knew what was happening in their hearts. They had seen and they respond. And we read in verse 15, they intended to make him king by force because they had seen what he could do. So just as things are getting out of hand, as as he sees what is stirring in the crowd's heart, he withdraws to a mountain. And his disciples get in a boat and cross to the other side of the lake to meet him. And if we jump to verse 22, this episode continues. The next day, the crowd who had been following to see these signs, to see the power, to get close, that the power might impact them, they see that they've lost the trail, that the boats are gone, that Jesus and the disciples have left. And so they get in their own boats to go find them. And when they find them, we find Jesus' response in verses 26 and 27. You're looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves. You had your fill, but do not work for food that spoils, for food, but for food that endures to eternal life. Remember why the crowd is following him. They had heard about and they had seen the signs. They were curious of the person powerful enough to make these miracles happen. And they came to see what else Jesus might do. And in this episode, they've experienced a taste of it. And having experienced a taste, they want it again. And so they pursue. They get in their boats and they pursue. They want Jesus to do more for them, to recreate the experience, to see it again. Jesus, do it again. Do it again. We want to see it again. Do it again. We're hungry again. We don't, we don't know their motivation, but they want more from him. And so we continue in verse 28, this confused conversation, these polarized opinions on what is happening in this moment and in this story. They say, you say, don't work for food that spoils. Okay, what do we need to do to do this work? Jesus responds in verse 29, the work of God is this, to believe. In the one he has sent, the conversation continues. Well, what sign are you going to give that we can believe you? Moses gave us bread in the wilderness. How are you going to prove it to us? Moses did this. Jesus responds in patience in verse 32. It's not Moses who has given you the bread, but it is my Father who has given you the true bread from heaven. The bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. 
verse 35 and 36, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me. You have kept seeing me. You are following me so that you can see me. And still, you do not believe. And we read the response. The grumbling echoes of the exodus. Israelites in the wilderness. The grumbling because the claims Jesus has made. I am the bread of life. They say, don't we know this guy's parents? We know where this guy is from. He's Joseph and Mary's. He's from Nazareth. This is their response. Do you remember, as we've walked through the Gospel of John, do you remember the mistake of Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman? Nicodemus, you must be born again. And his response, I can't be born again. I can't enter again into my mother's womb. Or the Samaritan woman, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would ask me for living water. And her response, sir, you don't even have a bucket. I can't be born again. You don't have a bucket. How can you offer me a drink? The Samaritan woman and Nicodemus both receive spiritual invitations from Jesus, but argue from logic and the physical, the tangible. And the crowd here responds in step. This can't happen. This can't be the real thing. Mary and Joseph's boy has lost his mind. But Jesus doubles down. If you look at 53 to 56, he begins, Unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man, things are getting odd here, and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. My flesh is real food. My blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. This is similar language we'll pick up again in John 15. Abide in me and I abide in you. But like Nicodemus and like the Samaritan woman, their response is, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? This is a physical impossibility. We're not cannibals. How can he do this? Remember that John is writing perspective decades after Jesus' death, the experience of what we'll read at the end of his gospel. And what has John's community been doing? They've been participating in what we know as communion, the remembrance of the Last Supper. Each time you eat of this, the broken bread, broken body, the shed blood. Each time you eat of it, do so in remembrance of me. But all they hear is cannibalism. Mary and Joseph's boy has lost his mind. And in their confusion, the crowd misses that they've just been invited to move beyond observation into participation. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me participates in my life, takes me into them and, and, and them into me. Jesus is the bread of life. That's the claim he's making. And what do you do with bread? You eat it. That it is in you, eating a symbol as a symbol of internalization. Whoever eats remains in me and I in them. There's an American Jesuit priest named Father Dan Berrigan, and he writes this. When I hear bread breaking, I see something else. It seems almost as though God never meant us to do anything else. So beautiful a sound, the crust breaks up like manna, falls over everything. And then we eat. Bread gets inside humans. With hindsight, we know what Jesus is inviting the crowd to, the practice of the people of faith. Each month we gather, we come to the front of our spaces, to the altar, to kneel, to receive the gift of the body and the blood. One of my friends shared one time that he loves when, uh, while taking communion, a little bit of the juice spills out on his hand or onto the floor. A reminder that communion is participation. 
that when we draw near, God, Jesus remains in us and we in him. So what is Jesus trying to communicate? There's an invitation. What is he trying to communicate? Remember who he's speaking to, a crowd that follows. A crowd that follows because of what they've seen and a desire that if they get close enough, the power might impact them. Maybe, just maybe, Jesus will do something again. And he'll do something for me. But we find that Jesus' vision here for the observer is that they would become participants and his prescription for participation is what? It's belief. His prescription for participation is belief and we shouldn't be surprised by the progression. Each week uh, in the Gospel of John, we've returned again and again to, to the end of the story where John tells us why he's writing. He explains his mission statement. John 20, 30 to 31, you'll be able to read it on the screen. John writes this. John performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these, these I present to you are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing we may have life in his name. You notice the trajectory. We've said John is writing so that we'll see Jesus, like the crowd that follows. They want to see, we want to see, but in seeing John's aim is that we would believe. And in believing, that we would become participants in his life. That we would experience and participate in life in Jesus. As he says, to have life in him. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me. And I in them. Do you see this progression from John 20 in John 6? The crowd was satisfied simply following, observing, hoping to, to catch a scrap from the table. But Jesus invites them to pull up a chair, to participate, to eat real food. He knew that they needed something better. He knew, as we know, that observation falls short of participation because nothing can satisfy like an experience of the truest thing, the real thing. As Pastor David expressed it this morning, the crowd wanted to see, but Jesus wanted them to believe. They wanted to eat, but Jesus wanted them to live so that we would see so that we would believe, so that we would participate in life in Christ. John is writing, we are reading this story, participating again in this narrative, that we might receive the same invitation. To move beyond observation and into participation, each time, each image that John lifts up, each narrative is an opportunity for those in the moment to see and to respond to believe in Jesus, to actually participate. The transformation defined by abundant joy at the wedding in Cana. The compassion of Jesus in his conversation with the curious Nicodemus. The offer of living water bubbling up to eternal life at the well in Samaria. Each moment, another opportunity to see and to respond. To believe, to move from observation to participation. But at the end of chapter 6, we see a familiar rhythm. We fall in line with a familiar pattern and we see the crack continue to divide. We read in verse 60, on hearing these words, many of his disciples, those who were following him, said, this is a hard teaching. This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And in verse 66, that from this time, many of his disciples turned away turned back and no longer followed him. This is both a turning point in John's gospel as we continue on to the end, but also a widening of the crack that John has been preparing us for from chapter 1. You remember chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. 
an opportunity to see and an opportunity to respond, to believe or to not believe. There are observers and participants, those who receive and those who do not, those who believe and those who do not, those who uh, earn the right, called called children of God. Are we observers or are we participants in the life of Christ? Jesus understands We have the opportunity to choose. We have the capacity to see and not believe. But his vision for our life is higher. His vision for our life is more true and more real and more sustaining. He wants us to step into a life that we could not muster or manufacture on our own. He wants us to believe. For the crowd moving beyond observation and into participation required Belief and the same is required of us. This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? To believe is to accept that something is true or that something exists. To believe is to feel sure that someone or something is capable of doing something. Specifically, to believe in Jesus is to accept that he is who he says he is. The Son of Man, the Word made flesh, the light and the darkness, the living water, the bread of life, better than all we lack or long for, better than our scrolling which breeds discontent, better than our searching for security through money, possessions, uh, positions, relationships. To believe is to trust, to develop and deepen a relationship in our life with Christ. And for us, like the crowd, It's a hard teaching, and it's a hard teaching for one reason, because it begins in humility. Owning honestly and admitting admitting that we have a need that we cannot fill. Jesus, we need what you're offering, my best efforts to manufacture are falling short. I want the real thing, but I can't muster it. C.S. Lewis expresses it this way. If we find ourselves with a desire that nothing this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. To change the language slightly, if we find ourselves working for a bread that will never satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for a different kind of bread. Are you an observer or are you a participant in the life of Jesus? Maybe a better question for us is, in what ways have we settled for anything less than participation in the real thing? For anything less than the one thing that can satisfy, the bread of life who comes from heaven. Your answer to these questions, I I don't know. Um, But wherever you find yourself this morning, if you recognize you're an observer, if you recognize that you're looking from the outside in, you're watching Jesus from afar, you may have been tagging along for a while, hoping that his power can do something. You're manufacturing a cure for the thing you long for. Or if your observation has brought you up in you a longing for, 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 for participation, if you've seen others' experience of Jesus, you've seen what he's done and is doing in their life, and you say, Jesus, would you do it in mine? Would you hear the invitation to the table to come and to eat, to remain in him, that he might remain in you? The invitation to taste the real bread that comes through being a participant in a relationship with Jesus, a belief that says, I believe you are who you say you are. At the very end of the passage, that's where where we see Peter arrive. Jesus turns again to the disciples. Verse 67 and 68, he says, you don't want to leave too, do you? And Peter answers, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We've come to believe it. We've experienced the real thing. So this morning, may we be participants. Those who pull up a table and share in the meal that Jesus offers. May we say with Peter, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe it. And this morning, may we be drawn to the humility that begins 
that journey. We can't manufacture it. We can't muster it. Jesus, would you give us this bread? Would you pray with me? Father, we are stirred again by the witness of your work and the response of all of those who have come before us, observers turned participants, receiving an invitation to a new kind of bread, to communion with you, to the reception of you that leads to abundant and eternal life. And God, we confess that that we turn away, that we choose the way of observation all too often. But God, Father, in humility, we're done trying to muster it. We simply say, Lord, to whom else would we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe it. Would you give us this bread? Would you help us to the table when we can't find it our own? Would you let the juice of the cup spill over us and onto the floor in abundance? Would you fill us up, Lord? We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.